This video is likely to piss off those with extreme views on this topic on either end of the spectrum, and what a shame. This is because we're going to do some videos on issues raised after our video Does the Funeral Industry Really Hate Caitlin Doherty? of which I was overwhelmed with the amount of support it got. Thank you so much. But as a psych and a death educator, I felt some things needed to be addressed. And the embalming is evil issue was one that really stood out. Please like, share and subscribe. It really means a lot. Now let's talk about the demonization of embalming. Demonization. The act or fact of regarding, treating or speaking of a person or thing as entirely bad. It has nothing to do with demons. Sometimes people only hear what they want to hear. So I will say this again. If you watch Miss Doherty's videos, it is clear that her perspective on embalming is that there should be less of it in the USA. She has never said to get rid of it completely. So when so many people in the comments of that video and in general from any country say embalming is evil, it should be outlawed, there's no need for embalming. I question their motivation, reasoning and understanding of the issue. And that is why we're going to look at its history and I mean really look at it. So if you're eating you might want to put that down now. And then look at why demonizing it is wrong. And cards on the table, I don't agree with embalming as general practice, I find it weird. And I'm lucky to live in a country where it is available if needed, but not the norm. So before you lash out, follow me with this. Why was embalming used in the 1800s? So we've said it many times and most of us are aware by now that embalming as we know it today came about from the US Civil War, which went on for four years, ending in 1865, and obviously thousands died. Now, most of these were either left to decompose on the battlefield and some were heaped into mass graves. But some were from rich families and they wanted their loved ones sent home to them, often hoping for a viewing. Remember, a viewing and home wake was a very important part of mourning culture back then and it would have been unthinkable to not have this happen. But at the start of the war, this was a grim undertaking. Yes, the new railroad made it quicker and easier than by foot or horse, but the corpse still had to travel between five days to a month to get where it needed to go. These weren't high-speed trains after all. And there was no refrigeration and it was often hot and humid. So those corpses being sent back at the beginning of the war were not in any state to be viewed, looking more like a deflated balloon combined with a beef stew with the smell of rotten eggs more than human. And let's not forget, these trains had multiple bodies on board and had to pass through multiple towns. These townspeople had to smell that, which as you can imagine wasn't great for morale or for just general living. Now at this time in history, many countries had been using arsenic to preserve medical specimens as the medical field was really starting to take off at this time. And in 1838, a Frenchman named John Ganau published a book in which he described the process that kept a body more or less intact, but replaced the body's blood with preservative, arsenic at the time, a technique known as arterial embalming. The book was translated into English in 1840, and in America, Thomas Holmes trained and worked as a coroner's physician in New York during the 1850s. He read about the arterial embalming process used in France, and he experimented with it in the US. He soon started teaching the method to others. Soon, many caught wind of these medical advances and opportunistic Americans began performing rudimentary embalmings on the corpses of northern soldiers to preserve them for the train ride home. Makeshift tents were set up next to battlefields and these individuals would even nudge soldiers before the battle to see if they wanted to prepay for their embalming just in case it didn't work out for them. Oh yeah, they weren't doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. No, no, even then it was for money. $100 a body back then is what they were charging. That's about 4,000 in today's money. Nearing the end of the war, an order had to be put in place that only professionals could do the job, but even then they were still charging. And it's estimated that of the 600,000 that died in the war, 40,000 were embalmed. Thomas Holmes himself is said to have embalmed 4,000 men himself, which means that in less than four years, he had earned in today's money $16 million. <music> Now, many already saw this as a lucrative opportunity and they weren't about to give that up. But it wasn't until Abraham Lincoln's death in 1863, when his wife chose to have him embalmed, that the public saw it as something to emulate. Now, it took a while for the public to truly get on board with the idea. After all, after the war, life went back to normal and people went back to dying at home close to family. Also, refrigeration was slowly becoming more commonplace. 
But those new embalmers weren't about to give up their opportunity and they began to strongly market the service. And when it looked like refrigeration would make embalming obsolete, they said, no worries, and changed the rationale of embalming from preservation to appearance and marketed it that way. And look what a good job they did. I mean, from a business perspective, that is some class A marketing that could be used as a case study in any business course. Demonizing embalming today. Sometimes I think the death positive crew forget that what we're trying to achieve isn't to take something from the current norm, but to add an alternative choice. These are not good, bad, right, wrong issues. Embalming seems to have become demonized in many people's minds because they seem to forget that there are legitimate uses for it sometimes that shouldn't be demonized. For example, here in Australia, we rarely use embalming. It's just not something we do. But there are two scenarios where it is required by law for very legitimate reasons. One, when the body is going to be placed in an above ground crypt and two, when the body needs to be transported by plane internationally. Now, many people assume that the body is embalmed for air travel simply to make it more presentable to the family and to help with their grief. And that is part of it, but there is so much more to it than that. While the body has been identified in the country the person was in, many countries will require the family to identify the body again when it is returned to them. Naturally, an embalmed body makes that task a bit easier than if it was starting to fall apart. Remember, it has to spend a lot of time on the tarmac, being transported between various locations, and in a plane hold that varies wildly in temperature and air pressure during a flight. And this often takes days. It also helps lessen the smell for the airport staff and the facilities that it will be in close proximity to. But here is another point that will affect you if you happen to be on that flight as well. For health and safety reasons, a corpse needs to be flown in a sealed casket, and for that it needs to be embalmed. Because you know what happens when you put an unembalmed body in a sealed casket on a long flight? The gases put out by the body while it decomposes, builds up, and the casket explodes. Now an exploding casket is well enough if it's under many layers of soil to protect it, but not on a plane, because a decomp is accelerated by air pressure on a flight that's not stabilized in the hole. And no one wants to be on a plane when a casket explodes with the force of an oversized pressure cooker. Do you know the damage that could cause? Not to mention all the luggage around it that will be affected. The embalming won't stop decomp altogether, but it will slow it down enough not to be a danger. It's the same reason for a body to be embalmed in a crypt. Those are sealed tight. They have to be, no one wants their dead mother accessible to vandals. But there is enough room for the slow release of gas from an embalmed body. But there is not enough room for the large amount of gases that an unembalmed body will put out. That can lead to a coffin exploding and damaging not only that body's resting place, but also the others around it. And you'd be pretty damn pissed if your father's resting place had its walls caved in because its neighbor exploded. And I know people will say when it comes to repatriation, well, they should just be cremated. They don't need to ship the whole body. Shouldn't that be their choice? Do you really want the person's right to choose to be taken away? Do you really want the government to tell funeral companies that they can't honor a grieving family's wishes? I doubt it. The psychology of good, bad thinking. Now I know many of you will be saying, oh, well, I know embalming is okay for that. In which case your argument isn't that you are against embalming. It is that you are against unnecessary embalming. And that's very different. And while I don't know Miss Doherty, I think that's more in line with what she's advocating for on those issues. And those who are fans need to recognize that. Because quite frankly, getting it wrong hurts those who are advocating for less of it. Militant viewpoints are helpful to no one. Tell someone they can't do something and they'll get their back up about it. Have you met a teenager? Tell them not to smoke and they'll do it just to rebel against you. But give them some graphic visuals of a smoker's lung and tell them they'll get laid less and suddenly they start listening. Can you tell I work with teenagers a lot in my early career? Now again, I don't agree with embalming as a general practice, but I'm not going to demonize those who choose to. And yes, I acknowledge it is easier for me to say that in a country where it's not common rather than how it is in the US, which was brought up in that video. Whether they choose to embalm for practical, legal, or cultural reasons, if you're telling someone they can't do something because it offends you or you just happen to think it's not right, that doesn't make you the good guy. Educate them, sure, there are environmental and space issues that we all know about. But lecture them and stamp your feet while looking down on them? No. That's not okay. And that can be said for many things, and as a psychic, it greatly concerns me. 
Critical thinking, looking at and analyzing all angles of an argument is a skill that people really need to start using when they explore these divisive topics. And I'm not here to lecture you. I'm here to remind you that issues like this cannot and will not be black and white, good or bad. It never leads to anything good. It is a very slippery slope and quite frankly, it pisses off people who are advocating for change. Now, when it comes to the US, the country that has the biggest use of embalming, not only do advocates have to remember that there are positive and necessary uses of embalming, but also need to remember that the US is not as united as they would like to tell the world they are. And there are different cultures within it, just like every other country. Even from the outside, we can see that there are strong cultural differences between the North and South, East and West. It has separate First Nation, White American, African American, Chinese American, Italian American cultures within. Point is, these cultures always stem from somewhere. This may be tens of thousands of years old, it may be a hundred years old, but it all develops from somewhere. And the case of embalming, it was the many factors that came together during the US Civil War. After that, some cultures in the US went, yeah, no thanks. And others said, yeah, we'll keep that. Now, whether certain parts of cultures should be stopped or should be preserved and continued is often a matter of opinion. But shockingly, it always works out better when that change comes from within the community. Any history book will show you that. The question is, when does a community choose to stop a practice that is dominant in their culture? When should outsiders tell them to stop something dominant in their culture? And that's a dicey question. Is it ever okay for one culture to tell another to stop something that means a lot to them? And embalming is now part of many of these different cultures and therefore is now a cultural issue. So with all these questions to answer, it will be very interesting to see how it pans out for them over the next few decades. Now we've made points for both practical and cultural reasons, which are relevant to not just one country, remember that. So let us know in the comments what you think about all this. And if you want to know more about embalming or the repatriation of a body, we will include links in the description to those videos. Now, go talk death.